a long Aus Billah in Shaitan Bajim, Smilah Rahman Rahim. We start with the recitation from the Holy Quran. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Wal Asr, Inna Linsan and Afikus, Illa Ladina Amanu, Amil Salihati, Watawasa with Hakti, Watawasa with Sub. Translation goes like this All humans, since there is gender consciousness these days, I'm not translating it as men or women. All humans are doomed except those who believe and those who do righteous acts and do and those who bear troubles in the way of Allah, endurance, and finally who stand for the truth. I welcome you all, ladies and gentlemen, to the second day of our round table with Dr. Israr Ahmed. Uh, I would like to inform you that this is not the first encounter which Dr. Islam Ahmad is having with Christian and people of other faiths. Rather, he has been visiting states and he has been invited on different occasions to meet people of other faiths, interfaith dialogue conventions, and especially, I will mention, there is an association of scriptural reasoning, and they held a meeting uh, quite a few years ago and he was invited there. And he exchanged ideas with Christians and with Jews and some other people. So this is our uh, second encounter, I would say, which is very close and uh, focused on certain topics and issues. This is our second day of deliberation. The first uh, session is on political and economic system of Islam. Yesterday, Dr. Israr explained to you that uh, Islam is not just a spiritual tradition, spiritual tradition in the sense of personal piety, rather it comprehends a socio-political order. It's a civilization, it is a complete way of life. And today he will elaborate on the political and economic system of Islam. I request Dr. Israr to present his ideas. Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. أما بعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال الله تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في سورة يوسف أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الحكم إلا لله وقال تبارك وتعالى كما ورد في سورة الشورى وأمرهم شورى بينهم صدق الله العظيم 
رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحل لقدتا من لساني يفقه قولي اي بريز الله ان سن ماي بليسنجز تو محمد هيز ميسنجر رادر لاست ميسنجر and i take to huge with allah from set in the accursed and i begin with the name of allah who is compassionate merciful then i have quoted two ayat from quran i will refer to them later on in my discourse as you know i have to speak but i can't elaborate as the brother said because we have only one hour at our disposal i can only give you a sketch brief sketch of the political and economic system of islam starting with the islamic polity the first point i want to make is that islamic state or islamic polity is not democracy nor it is theocracy nor it is aristocracy nor it is dictatorship nor it is monarchy none of these terms suits with islam but if we want to use these terms because we know the connotations of these terms and because we have to be brief Islamic polity is theo democracy two elements have been joined together now democracy is based on popular sovereignty sovereignty in islam belongs to god not to any person any king any sovereign any emperor or to the whole humanity it is one of the biggest sins in islam to associate anyone as partner in the sovereignty of god it is shirk and this shirk in islam is unpardonable he is unique and that is why first of all i quoted the ayah from surah yusuf it is surah number 12 and ayah number 40 in al hukm illa lillah sovereignty belongs to allah alone there is no sovereign no ruler no lawgiver except allah and this subject has been repeated in the quran so many times so many times so many times we find in surah bani israil surah 17 aya 111 lam yakul lahu sharikun fil mulk there has been no partner with him in sovereignty he is the king he is the ruler and we find in the next surah surah 26 surah al kahf ayah 26 wala yushriku fi hukmihi ahada he is not ready to accept any partner in his sovereignty at so many places we find the word al malik the king for allah in the beginning of surah al jumah in the end of surah al hash al malik al quddus as salam al mu'min eight names of allah in rapid sequence in one ayah of quran eight names but the first one is al malik he is the king he is the sovereign so here we rule out democracy democracy based on popular sovereignty sovereignty of the people but theocracy what does it mean rule of some clergy or some caste as in hindus brahmanism there is no brahmanism in islam there is no rule by clergy in islam 
no pope. So this is not theocracy. I need not go into detail, dictatorship or aristocracy, none of them fits in. Now what is the relationship of the theo element and the demo element of this theo democracy? Let me mention here this term was coined by Maulana Maududi. The credit should go to him and I agree with him, yes, theo democracy. The theo element are the injunctions of the Quran and the Sunnah. No person, no class, no clergy. And the demo element is the shura, the mutual consultation about those things in which we don't have any clear injunction of the Quran and the Sunnah. Let me explain it with an example. And here I am referring to a hadith of the Prophet Mumin, believers, they are like a horse tied to a peg. A believer is not free to do whatever he likes. He is a bondsman to Allah. He believes in Allah, so he has to accept his commandments. He is bound by them. He believes in the Prophet, so he has to follow the example of the Prophet. Another binding. He believes in Quran, so he has to obey the injunctions of the Quran. So he is like a horse tied to a peg. Now I extend this simile. If we have an open ground and we want that the horse should also run and you move, if we can tie this horse with this peg with a rope 200 yards long, a circle with a radius of 200 yards come into existence. In this circle, the horse is free to move to the east, to move to the west, to move to the north, to move to the south, to 50 yards, to 100 yards, to 150 yards, to 200 yards, but not an inch beyond the 200 yards. Can't go. Tied up. Now, in this example, this circle represents the injunctions of the Quran and the tradition of the Prophet. We can't go beyond this. But within this circle we are free. And Quran says it is Amruhum. Allah has left this circle for the people to decide. And there they can decide by mutual consultation. Amruhum shura bainahum. The matter that Allah has left for you to decide, you can have mutual consultation. And you can make decision by counting of words, no harm. For example, if you have, have to hold a reception at your house, what drink is to be served? No alcohol, gone. That is beyond that circle. But any beverage, any syrup, you can serve and you can decide by counting the words which one is to be served. So this is the demo element, democracy. Here nobody holds the authoritative position that I will say whatever I say you have to know. Nobody. This is amruhum. This is the matter left by Allah for the community. They will decide it. So in this way, Islamic polity, Islamic state is a combination. Within this circle, you can establish the best norms of democracy, best norms, best norms of democracy. We can say it's limited democracy, but limited not by any person, not by any human being, not by any class of people, not by any nation over any other nation. Limited only by the injunctions of the Quran and the tradition of the Messenger of Allah. Now, I come to the second point. 
if sovereignty belongs to God, what remains for the mankind? That is called khilafa, vicegerency. Allah created Adam according to the Quran as vicegerent on earth. Vicegerency, and what is the relationship between the sovereign and the viceroy or the vicegerent? We have our experience, and Brother Markham must be knowing it. We were subjects to the Britishers. The sovereign was there, the king or the queen of England. We had a viceroy in Delhi. What was the relationship? Whatever instructions are coming from His Majesty's government or Her Majesty's government, they have to be implemented as such. The Viceroy can't change them. But where there is no clear instruction from His or Her Majesty's government, the Viceroy has to look to the local conditions, use his best judgment. What would be in the best interest of the, of the kingdom? And he can take a step. So this is the relationship of man with Allah. فَإِمَّا يَاتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا Whenever some guidance comes to you from me, you have to obey them. But wherever there is no clear injection, it's your matter, you decide by mutual consultation, and you are a vicegerent of Allah. Now let me give you a brief history of this vicegerency. Till such time that the institution of prophethood was continuing, this vice regency was personal. The prophet was the vice student of Allah because he had the connection with the sovereign. The why the revelation was coming to him. He was the recipient of the orders, divine orders, instructions from the sovereign. So it was a personal vicegerency. And let me give you an example about David, Dawood alayhi salam. Quran says, Ya Dawood, inna jalna ka khalifatan fil ard. O oh David, we have made you the vicegerent on earth. Till Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa this institution of caliphate, vicegerency, was personal. Muhammad was Khalifa of Allah. Although this word is not used for Muhammad, his position that he was a messenger is so profound that no other position can be ascribed to him. But he was the Khalifa. Who was the ruler at Medina? And in his last days, who was the ruler of? over the Arabian Peninsula, Muhammad. He was getting instructions from Allah. But after the death of Muhammad وسلم, and the end of the chain of prophets and messengers, now this has become a collective institution. Just as monarchy, sovereignty of Pharaoh, sovereignty of a king, and the divine rights of the kings, now it is popular sovereignty, not personal. Except for the king in England, only a token, maybe a decoration piece and nothing else. Same case in Japan. But sovereignty is to the people, collective. But the, for the first time in human history, this Republican type of government, people having that authority, was the collective caliphate of the Muslims. Now the caliph, the viceroy, the vice student, was to be elected through mutual consultation. But I am talking about only the pious caliphate of Abu Bakr, Omar, Ali and Usman. Later on, it turned into monarchy, kingship. Although that kingship was also bound by the laws of Allah, 
But now it was a dynasty going on. Whether they were the Umayyads or the Abbasids or the Ottomans, it was a dynasty. Not appointment of a caliph through popular consultation. Now this is the vice chairmancy. Now the third point is, we have to derive the fundamentals and the principles of Islamic State, a modern Islamic State, from the Quran, the tradition of the Prophet, the example of the pious caliphs. But exact replica of the pious caliphate cannot be established again in this world due to three things. That period of pious caliphate was an appendix to the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Continuation. Number two. The purification of the selves of the companions that had been done and achieved by Muhammad was to such a level that we could never fear any selfishness, self-interest from those people who had been trained and purified by Muhammad. We can't expect this level of piety and selflessness now. Number three, that was a tribal society. For mutual consultation, there was no need of taking the opinion of every person. The chiefs of the tribes, the heads of the families, if they consulted with each other, the object of consultation, mutual consultation was fulfilled. That is not the case today. It's not a tribal society, mostly. Somewhere in the corners of the world there might be a tribal system. We have it in our Balochistan and so on. But generally it has gone. So now we have to derive the principles of Islamic State from the example of the pious caliphate, the four caliphs, and fundamentals from Quran and Sunnah. But we have to take and borrow the institutions that have been developed by the West. What board of mutual consultation? You know, Abu Bakr said, I am accountable before you. If I go wrong, you disobey me and correct me, rectify me. I am no dictator, I am no ruler. I am not infallible. I can commit an error. And then you have to rectify. But how to rectify? Who will rectify you? There was no institution. Just for example, the impeachment of the president of America, institution. There was no in this, any this type of institution over there. The same thing was said by Umar. If I take the right path, you have to obey me. If I go on the wrong, you have to rectify me. What will you do then? A Bedouin stood up, he took out his sword. We shall rectify you with this. And he said, thank God that I am not leading the dumb people. Dumb or deaf, no. So, Institutions we have to borrow from the West, just as this light, you know, not invented by a Muslim. We are using it. This loudspeaker, not invented by any Muslim, we are using it. In the same way, institutions we have to borrow. So we have to have three pillars of the state. Although they say that there is a fourth pillar also. We have to have a legislature. We have to have a legislature 
an executive and a judiciary with defined authorities, defined limits, defined checks and balances. Now, what is the scope of legislature? It's a very common misunderstanding that there's no scope of legislature in the modern Islamic state. Islamic law is already there. We have only to enforce it. No. The clear do's and don'ts from Quran, we have to abide by that, or from the Sunnah. But there's a vast area, very vast area of legislation about the foreign policy, about the form of government, whether it should be unitary or federal or confederal, whether it should be parliamentary, two house, or one house, parliamentary or presidential. These are all mubah, and please note, in Islamic law, the principle is not that only such things are permissible which can be proved to be permissible by Quran and Sunnah. No. Everything is permissible which cannot be proved to be forbidden according to the Quran and the Sunnah. So these two things are very different. Had the case been the former one, the legislative scope would have been very narrow. But here, everything is halal, permissible, unless it can be proved to be haram, forbidden, by the injunctions of the Quran and the Sunnah. So vast field, the taxation policy, what type of a government you want, what subjects you want, an authority you want to give to the provinces or the states, and what you have want to retain for the center, etc., etc., etc. Why it's so? And now framing these laws now by the legislature is called ijtihad. Ijtihad, the root is the same as johud from which we derive jihad, to struggle, to strive. Ijtihad is to exert yourself to the utmost, to frame a law or rule about something which has appeared now, it was not present in the days of the Prophet. So you have to derive from Quran and Sunnah, and this inferring, deriving, so that you don't cross the limits of the Sharia, but within the limits of the Sharia, you are passing a new law. This is Ishtihad. Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladzina amanu, atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul wa uli lambi minkum. This is the fifth surah, ayah 59. Oh, you who believe, or profess to believe, I am including Muslim and Mormon both. Oh, you believe, who you believe, or all who profess to believe. Obey Allah, obey His Messenger. And people who hold authority amongst you, from among you, not Muslim. We are not allowed by Quran to obey non-Muslims, but we can be forced to slavery. We have been forced. But Quran doesn't allow us. Those who hold authority from amongst you. So we have to see to Quran, to his, the tradition of the Prophet, and then the people who hold authority. At that time, the caliphs, and then the kings, and the modern state, it will be the parliament. Now, ijtihad can be done by any scholar, any learned man, any alim, but whose ishtihad will be enforced as law. That will be decided by the parliament. And this is what Iqbal said in his lectures. Now ishtihad would be through parliament. 
it doesn't mean the power the parliament is sovereign to frame anything it can make its jihad within the limits of the sharia and then every citizen will have a right if he thinks that any proposed piece of legislation has crossed the boundary of sharia he can knock the door of the judiciary parliament has transgressed its limits because in the constitution it has been laid down that sovereignty belongs to god and no legislation can be done repugnant to the quran and the sunnah let me have a chance to prove it in the court not any body of ulama court judiciary and definitely in an islamic state the judges would be learned in islamic law in sharia but it is not out of their belonging to some class of clergy but the judiciary they will decide and if they come to the conclusion that yes this piece of legislation has transgressed the limits of the sharia it will be done and void but the matter will be referred back to the parliament frame new law so now i have to make haste what about the elections in islamic state who will have the right to vote what would be the age number one it is adult suffrage for every muslim he can vote i missed one point the caliphate collective caliphate is the caliphate of the muslims not of the non muslims someone who doesn't accept god as his lord that is ruler he forfeits his right of vicegerency so morana madudi used the term popular vicegerency and here i disagree with him it is not the popular vicegerency popular means all the people living in that state state irrespective of their religion or anything no this will be the caliphate of the muslims khalifatul muslimin just as the parliament members in the democracy all the citizens are sovereign but they delegate their sovereignty to the person whom they are voting for and now those people are sitting in the parliament and exercising the right of sovereignty framing laws in the same one every muslim living in that islamic state by his vote he delegates his vice presidency to the persons who are sitting in the shura or the parliament but they will be muslims only this is the bitter thing and very unpalatable for present civilization the present western civilization i am coming to that so now election can be by mutual consultation we can fix the age but all muslims men and women will have the right of vote age can be fixed by mutual consultation amrohum shura bainahum and as regards the candidates who come forward i think his age should be fixed at 40 at least because in one ayah number 15 of surah al ahqaf allah taala has fixed the age of 40 for psychological maturity of human beings and then he has to pass through screening what is his character in islamic state and and in the court no muslim can appear as a witness unless he is screened what's your character what your neighbor say about you how have you accumulated this wealth can you justify so very thorough screening of those who come forward to fight the election this is the only distinction otherwise all muslim males and females are eligible to vote now coming to non muslims yesterday more than one brother said that you have spoken frankly so i have to be frank again 
non muslims in an islamic state are not full citizens of that state because this is an ideological state it's not a nation state that people living in some geographical area they are all equal citizens irrespective of their faith religion creed whatsoever it is not the case with the islamic state only who believe or profess to believe only who, who are muslims i told yesterday that the basic of islamic state and islamic society is islam not iman now what are their rights they are free to practice any religion believe anything they like one god hundred gods goddesses gods they are free to worship anything any person any deity they like they will have their personal law absolutely independent of free they will practice their own personal law the places of their worship i said yesterday also will be protected more than the mosques they are sacred they will be free to do business to enter services and if they like even army but they are not bound for military service all muslims will be bound for that whenever they are required it will be a people's army just like china and israel people will be working but they are all soldiers so they are called and they take the part in the defense of the country or whatsoever it is they are free to preach their dogma their religion their beliefs to their people and their children and their next generation they can have schools for them only not the muslims they are not allowed to preach their religion to the muslims here you have to note that because the basis of the state is religion the the basis and the foundation of the state can be eroded and corroded if this freedom is given now only two places where the non muslims will not be able to participate one is the legislature it's very logical that has to be based on quran and sunnah and they neither believe in quran nor in the sunnah nor in the prophet so only muslims can go there the non muslims can have their own parliament consultation body to fight for their rights to represent themselves oh okay okay but the legislature has to be of muslims number 2 the highest positions where the policy is framed of the state non muslims will not be included there because the basic policy of islamic state is to propagate islam throughout the world try to establish islam as a political socio economic system over the whole of the globe that has to be the basic policy of an islamic state and it's clear that no non muslim will be contributing to this so these are the only two places otherwise they are free and then they have to pay tax muslims will be paying zakat an obligatory tax obligatory charity 2.5% of all your belongings but a fixed jizya we call it and there is a very bad taste about this word jizya it is from jaza the reward because islamic state is providing them peace tranquility security just like the concept of taxes why do people pay taxes 
to make the government able to have peace there, security, defending the country, you need army, you need force. So non-Muslims will pay jizya or tax. And it is a poll tax on every individual. It will be forced. So now, I think I have covered the basic questions regarding Islamic polity. Now I turn to Islamic economic system. Here I have to be more brief. It's a very complicated subject. And I told you in the very beginning, I have not been a student of philosophy or student of economics. But because Quran claims that it is the guidance for whole mankind for all time to come till the end of this world. So it has touched and discussed all these aspects of human life. On that basis, I find myself, you know, having a right to speak on these topics also. I will keep, you know, two reference points. Capitalism and communism. Although communism, it is said it is dead. I think it can be resurrected. It was a reaction to capitalism. And now the capitalism is going much farther, much farther, much farther. And the reaction you saw in Seattle, in Davos, in Washington, this is the reaction to that global capitalism. If Islam doesn't come in this world, kept this communism in another form, another shape, socialism will come as a reaction. So now these two systems, they are the point of reference. And I don't need to go into details. Private ownership, not only of the articles of use, but also the means of production, a factory, a mill, a farm, anything. Here, on the other side, no private ownership. In the beginning, that was total negation, but then they allowed private ownership of the articles of use. You can own a small house, a bicycle, or a car, and so on, for use, not for production. What was the result? Positive result of capitalism. Personal incentive to work harder. If I earn more, I possess more. Competition. Better production. Free market. No controls. Let the prices be determined by the demand and supply. If the demand is more, supply is less, prices will go high, let them go high. If the demand is more and, and supply is less, otherwise it can happen. The authority to hire and fire. So if you want to remain as an employee, you have to work. You have to work. So the production was more. On the other side, no personal incentive. You have to pay wages only. That's all. Why to work harder? Why to produce more? You will not possess more. You will be given the same fixed wage. So no improvement in the quality of production. Quantity, quality, both remain back. And that was the fall of communism, the cause of the fall of communism. In the beginning, there was an ideological fervor which sustained that economy. But this ideological fervor became diminished and diminished and diminished and diminished. So what happened? 
the area of wheat growing of Russia was far more than the area of America. But America was exporting wheat and, and Russia was importing it. But on the other side, the positive point of communism or socialism, not a very wide gap between the haves and the have-nots. There was a difference. A foot constable or an ordinary soldier and the commander-in-chief, they couldn't be equal in their salaries. But they say that the most difference maximum was 1 to 30. That's all. And in that system, appalling gulf between the haves and the have-nots. But then, the capitalism had to make a correction. This gulf has to be kept in certain limits. If the poor are hungry, they will attack you, they will revolt. So give them subsistence level, unemployment, allowance, some sort of security, social security. Give them something. Otherwise, they will revolt. I hear that they call it the internal management of capitalism. Now, what is Islam? Maybe you are astonished to know, according to me, my study, Islam doesn't have one economic system, it has two. One economic system at the height of spirituality, deep faith and height of spirituality. The system is something else. At the legal level, at the common people level, the system is something else. There are four cardinal principles of Islamic economic system at the high spiritual level or the deep level of belief and Iman. Number one, nobody owns anything. Neither individuals, nor the nation, nor the state. Ownership is for Allah. Just as in the political system, we said, ruler is Allah. Sovereignty belongs to him and him alone. In the same way, Lillahi mafi samawati wa mafi You don't own anything. Ownership belongs to Allah. You are only custodians. Parallel to caliphate. These are custodians. You don't own even your body. You have to be caliph of Allah on your body also. To enforce the divine law on your own person. In your own home. In the same way, ownership belongs to Allah. Nobody owns anything. Number two, whatever you earn, maybe through agriculture, maybe through business, maybe through industry, or service somewhere in the offices, etc., etc. Whatever you get is not your earning. It is the bounty of Allah. You know, if you have hired a person for working as a laborer and you say, I will pay you $20 in the evening, you have to work for eight hours here. Now, if you find that the person has worked very hard in a very responsible way, he didn't need any supervision to work. He was working out of his own responsibility. So in the evening you give him $20 plus 5 more. 
This is fuzzy. He couldn't demand it. It is not his earning. He could demand only twenty dollars. The extra five are fuzzy in the terminology of Quran. Surplus. So whatever you get in this world is fuzzy of Allah, not your earning. The word of earning is Quran uses for whether you are earning virtues, good deeds for the reward in the hereafter, or you are earning bad deeds resulting in punishment in the hereafter. These are the earnings. Laha ma kasabat wale ha maktasabat. Kasb to earn mostly, except only in one place in Quran that is used for earning also. Earning materially. Now the first principle, nobody owns anything, neither individuals nor the state. Everything belongs to God. Whatever you get in this world is the bounty of Allah, not the result of your labor. Number three. Out of this which you have been given, your right is only limited to your needs. Whatever is surplus from your needs is the right of the poor, people who have remained behind. financially. Or you may say, it is for Allah. Give it away. It's not yours. Allah has put it in your wealth to test you, whether you keep it for yourself or you give it to the people whose right it is, not yours. Yes, saluna ka maza yunfiqoon qulil af. When there was, you know, instruction and persuasion, spend for the cause of Allah, spend for the pleasure of Allah, spend and spend and spend and spend a thousand times. People asked, what is the limit? How much? Yes, Salulaka Masa Yunfiqoon, how much we have to spend for the pleasure of Allah? Answer was, laugh. whatever is spare, whatever is more than your needs, whatever is surplus, give it up. Don't keep it with you. This is the right of the deprived people. These four cardinal principles go to make a complete economic system. The Prophet ﷺ himself he lived at this level, never accumulated any wealth, no penny to be retained. And there were a number of his companions whom we call fuqara sahaba Abu Zar, Abu Darda. They were living at this level. And after that pious caliphate, the Muslim saints whom we call Sufiya, they lived at this level. And in a Muslim society, although these people will be in a very minute minority, but they are the pacemakers. Who is to be honored? Who is to be respected? The wealthy man or this person who owns nothing, who retains no wealth? He is to be honored. He is to be respected. The moral values, the pace making of these moral values is done by these people who are living their life at this level of economic system. But this is absolutely voluntary, not forced. There is no fixed level that this is your requirement and this is not your requirement. You have to fix it yourself. The more you believe in the hereafter, the more you will tighten your belt and spend more, more for the, for the pleasure of Allah. So that you get the reward in the hereafter. 
to give you an example of the teaching how the prophet used to teach his people a goat was sacrificed in the house of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala the wife of the prophet all the meat was distributed among those poor people the ashab suffa there were people you know who were sitting in the mosque only to learn from the prophet doing nothing no business no labor so it was distributed she only kept one shoulder because this meat of the shoulder was liked by the prophet he retained when the prophet came he asked what remained of that goat he answered nothing but a shoulder he said no whole of the goat has been saved except this shoulder which we will consume what we have given it is saved forever just as jesus said don't collect in this world where there is fear of theft where things you know are destroyed why not gather everything in the hereafter there's no not going to be any theft there no loss why do you deposit in the banks over here why not deposit in the divine bank of the hereafter so this is voluntary and that is the beauty of it not forced it's not legal legal things are forced now i come to the second legal system legal economic system of islam it is controlled and internally managed capitalism private ownership is allowed you can have a shop you can have a factory you can have a farm a limited sense it is your property but it is actually is divine trust with you sacred trust with this principle all those things of capitalism come there to play which was not there in communism personal ownership personal incentive competition try to improve your product you have to compete in the market try to lessen the price you have to compete in the market all these cardinal principles of capitalism by virtue of which capitalism triumphed and succeeded and fukuyama boasted this is the end of history it is proved that this system of ours based on liberal democracy and capitalistic economy is the best there's no rival man has reached the pinnacle the climax there's nothing else who can come and confront our system but islam has done two master strokes by which capital will play a role in the economy but it will not go beyond certain limits to become an overall controller of the economy chaining this genie of capital as the wells have mentioned in this part in the short history of the world on roman empire that the concept of currency came only in the roman empire for the first time and man didn't know what type of you know chains he has attached it to himself and bound by those chains through this currency before that it was all barter system 
ون از ورکنگ ان دی فیلڈ ہی ہیز گرون ویٹ ادر ون از سٹنگ یو نو اینڈ ویونگ کلاتھ یو ایکسچینج دی کلاتھ فار دی ویٹ دیٹس آل دیر کین بی نو ہولڈنگ دیر کین بی نو مینیپولیٹنگ آف دی مارکیٹ نتھنگ سمپل بٹ وین کرنسی کیم دس مچ آف گولڈ از ایکول ٹو سو مینی ماؤنٹس کلو گرامس تھاؤزینڈ کلو گرامس آف ویٹ دس مچ اور دس مچ گولڈ از ایکول ٹو تھاؤزینڈ یارڈس آف دس کلاتھ ناؤ دس از دی کی یو کیپ دیٹ گولڈ ان یور اینڈ دیٹ یو کین مینیپولیٹ پرائس از گوئنگ ہائی پرائس از کمنگ لو سو اسلام ہیز چینج دس جنی آف کیپیٹل سو دیٹ اٹ شوڈ کم ان دی فیلڈ اینڈ پلے اٹس رول بٹ ناٹ اوور شیڈو دی ہول آف اکانومی نمبر ون نو انٹرسٹ واٹس سو ایور ارننگ ہیز تھری ایلیمنٹس لیبر کیپیٹل and then chance also the same amount of labor and capital earns some amount of profit at one time and the same amount of labor and capital may earn different amount at different time but in principle capital earning capital haram except you a few cases i will let you know basic proposition is capital with labor this is the rightful earning only capital being an earning agent this is interest this is usury both declared haram it was haram According to Judaic law also, as far as I know, and it is haram in the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now the exceptions are only if you build a house, you can rent it out. Here also you are not working, but you are earning due to your capital. But this capital is fixed. If you give 10 million pounds or, or dollars to a person who is working, maybe he earns and it becomes 15 million. Maybe he loses and he has now only 8 million with him. So that is different and this is different. Here it is a stationary solid form of capital. It is not going to increase or decrease that way. Because you have lived here for one month, you have to give some reward for that. This is permissible. Ijara. In the same way, if somebody has some capital, some money, but he cannot do any business himself. Either you know he is sick or ill or old, or he doesn't have that faculty. He gives this money to anybody. You do the business. This is called Muzaraba in Islam. But in this proposition, if there is a loss, it will be borne by the man who possesses the capital, not by the worker. If there is some gain, then it can be shared. The risk is to the capital, not to the labor. Another form could be, and that is the normal form, you join together and you pool your money, your capital, and you are doing business, okay. But you give your money to someone, he is working, and you say, I don't know whether you gain or you lose. I mu must get the pound of my flesh, you know. I have to get it, the pound of the flesh. I have to have 10%, 15%. 16 person, uh, that is my right. You might have lost, you might have gained. There are other means also 
بائی وچ اسلام ہیز چینڈ دس کیپٹل دس جنی آف کیپٹل دیر شوڈ بی انویسٹمنٹ دیر شوڈ بی ورکنگ ود دی کیپٹل بٹ ناٹ آن انٹرسٹ اینڈ انٹرسٹ آف بوتھ ٹائپس یوزلی ایز ویل ایز ایز ویل ایز بزنس اینڈ کمرشل انٹرسٹ یس نمبر ٹو گیمبلنگ کارپیٹن ہیئر یو آر ناٹ لوز اونلی ڈیو ٹو چانس ارن بائی لیبر اینڈ دس تھنگ ناؤ ایز یو نو ہیز بیکم دی گریٹسٹ تھنگ ان دی ہول ورلڈ اسپیکولیشن ٹیکنگ دی مارکیٹ اپ اینڈ راؤنڈنگ اٹ ٹو دی باٹم دی کیپٹلسٹ کین پلے ڈیو ٹو اسپیکولیشن دین دیر کین بی نو ٹریڈنگ either cash give the price take the material or if it is for, for future you have to pay the total value in the first instance by salam it is called if you have make an agreement that in next week season you will provide me 1000 mounds or 1000 kilograms of wheat at this rate Now calculate the total value and give the total value now, then only you are entitled to get those thousand kilograms of wheat at that time. Not after paying 10% or 5% or 10% and then you know the deal is done. No. By this, I will again use the word master stroke. Over trading is stopped. You do the trading within your limits, whatever capital you have. Over trading. The capital going far out. So these are some of the measures. The most important, riba. There is nothing more haram and more forbidden and more disliked in Islam than interest. Allah says, if you don't give it up, then listen, there is an ultimatum from Allah and His messenger against you. Allah will go to war against you. In the belief, shirk, to assign some partner to Allah. And in actions, this riba, interest, the worst things, according to the Islamic Sharia. Now what is the internal management? institution of zakah and here is a fixed line if you own seven tolas i think it will become three or four ounces if somebody can correct me you are above this line this poverty line you know had been fixed 52 tolas of silver seven tolas of gold if you have you are a donor. If you don't have, you are a recipient. This zakah is to be taken from you legally, forcibly. And the first caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr, fought against those people who refused to pay this zakah. That is one of the pillars of Islam. I talked about the pillars of Islam yesterday. The shahada, the five prayers, the zakah, obligatory charity, and the song, fasting, and hajj. This is one of the pillars. Although he was advised, don't declare war against them. We are going to war against those people who have claimed the false prophets, who have stood up and we are also prophets. And also, the war started with the Romans. So don't open the third front. He said, no, I have to do it. 
سو دس زکا تو خز و بن اگنی آئے ہم و ترب دو الاف و قرائے ہم اٹ از ٹیکن ایکسٹریکٹڈ آؤٹ آف دی رچ اینڈ دی رچ آر دوز ہو آر ابو دس لائن اینڈ دے آر ریٹرن اینڈ گیون ٹو دوز ہو آر پور بٹ دی پور از ناٹ دی ون ہو ہیز نتھنگ ٹو ایٹ بٹ دی ون ہو ڈزنٹ ہیو ففٹی ٹو ٹو لاز آف سلور اینڈ سیون ٹو لاز آف گولڈ ان دس وے because there is free competition and in free competition there necessarily there will be people who will go forward and some will remain backward free competition so now who have remained backward they have to be taken care of by those who have gone ahead this is the internal management but the beauty of this islamic system is that the moral teaching is don't accept zakah work is against your dignity not like you know the right we have the right to have this social security it's our right we have to have it no the moral teaching is earn for yourself don't live on this charity so there goes to be a very big difference between the two but i request to add one point to the political structure which i forgot it's not one party system in islam multiple party system but the manifestos of all the parties will be screened that none of the manifestos contains anything against the injections of the Quran and the Sunnah. But there can be different parties, different, they can have different outlooks on taxation, they can have different outlook on the provincial authority and the central authority, and they can have different these things. Whichever is permissible and mubah, not haram, not proved to be forbidden, they can include but it has to be screened or somebody can go to the court just like you know if a piece of legislation has been passed by the legislature i have the right to go and knock the door of the hard judiciary that this is against islam this is against the quran and the sunnah in the same way prashar ahmed has a almost almost barely very barely and schematically stated the essentials of uh, two very important areas of corporate life, our political system and poli- uh, economic system. And he has, he has studied his normative point of view, of course, gleaned from Quran and Sunnah. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim We have heard Dr. Sarayman's presentation on, very two, on two very sensitive uh, issues, the political system of Islam and the economic system of Islam. The two areas are very sensitive. Only one of us has his own sensibilities, coming from different cultures, of course, different uh, mindset. Uh, we may have different ideas, but Dr. Sarayman is essentially representing Quran and Hadith. That is his normative point of view. Now, for interaction, I would first request Dr. Norton. Um, I have listened attentively to what you've said, and I feel obligated as a proud Jew, let me say, who believes in Judaism, but perhaps even more importantly, as an open-minded and I hope compassionate human being, uh, and uh, who, um, and as an advocate uh, of democracy, uh, I really feel that I must make a brief, respectful, but also frank comment that you may answer if you wish. Now, for much of my life in my teaching, writing, and human rights act- activity, I have struggled against the Jewish exclusivity of the state of Israel, made so by its Zionist character. As a number of great Jewish thinkers have argued in the past, and do argue today, this exclusivity is in opposition to basic human values in Judaism. This state incorrectly presumes to speak for all the Jews of the world. 
The state is an exclusivist one because it grants rights and privileges by law to Jews, not granted to non-Jews. The state has also oppressed the indigenous Palestinian population in order, in order to maintain itself as a Zionist state. Here is the heart center of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. As, al as, I, as already stated, as I already stated, I have opposed and do oppose the exclusivist state of Israel just as I oppose other types of exclusivist states based upon race, color, and or religion. I have witnessed in the past decade especially growing numbers of Jews who, although still a minority, agree with the position that I have. This minority includes both religious and secular Jews. The religious Jews, by the way, believe that today the Torah is valid, alive, and is correctly the word of God, just as you believe the same for the Quran. They, by the way, would be surprised, as frankly was I, if they heard or read some of your interpretations of Judaism that they consider to be factually incorrect, such as your comments yesterday about uh, Torah following the destruction of the first temple in 586 before the Common Era, the meaning of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and your written comment in this pamphlet about Jews believing they are exempt from punishment by God on the Day of Judgment, which, according to uh, Judaism, is not correct. The Jews, religious and secular, who believe, as do I, about exclusive estates, obviously reject your advocacy of an Islamic state in Israel or anywhere else in which non-Jews and others do not have all the same human rights, including all of the political rights, that includes the right to vote as well, as do Muslims. Those Jews who believe in Zionism and support the Jewish exclusive state, they also, of course, certainly reject your idea that could, if your advocacy prevails totally at any time in the future, could result uh, at some point in an Islamic state in all of historic Palestine, which encompasses the present state of Israel. Presently, then, 5.2 million Jews reside in Israel. Not many, if any, Israeli Jews would accept your advocacy in an Islamic State. In the late 1970s, at a meeting in London, organized by the Organization of the Islamic Conference, to which I was invited as a panelist, I said this to the Palestinian Islamic theologian Ismail al-Faruqi, who advocated an Islamic State for the whole Middle East, including Palestine, Israel. He answered, that the only three choices for Jews in Palestine would be to leave, to accept the Islamic State, or to stay, fight, and then be expelled or killed. Now, before asking you to state if you would answer likewise, I wish to point out briefly, in addition, that an American scholar from Harvard, as you probably know, Samuel Huntington, espoused a theory a few years ago that there was a clash of civilizations between the West and Islam. Some other scholars agree with this theory. Some, like myself, argue that this theory is incorrect. Key advisors to President George W. Bush believe and advocate this theory. What you have said indicates to me that you believe this theory to be correct, even though you were on the Islamic side of the argument. If I am correct in my assumption, you are, I suggest, actually helping the advocacy of the Bush advisors, even though that is, of course, not your intent. Perhaps you would also comment upon this. Again, I make this uh, comment respectively, respectfully but sincerely. Yesterday, you advocated serious debate and dialogue with non-Muslims. I also make my brief comment in that context and with that spirit. Admittedly, I am ready to pursue further discussion, debate, and dialogue with you, although, given your belief that you have the truth from God through Muhammad, I certainly do not think that I can shake you even to question your faith. And I have doubts that you will be able to convince me to believe differently than I do. Perhaps, then, the discussion will be useful only to the extent that we make sure we understand one another's positions and views correctly. Thank you. I don't think I have to say anything about these comments except one. 
the alternatives for Jews or Christians or Hindus or Sikhs or an Islamic state, they are not only three that either they leave or they become Muslims or they fight. No. I told you they can remain in Islamic state, they can remain Jews, they can remain Christians, they can remain Sikhs, they can remain Hindus. But the overall political socio-economic system will be Islamic. But you have the right to believe anything, you have the right to, to worship anything in any way you like. You have the authority to practice your own personal law. I, I have told you. They could stay. Yes. That's definitely. one option. Definitely. There but, are two others. But they are not equal citizens. May I? Have you? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I have a couple of observations, questions, uh, precisely on issues relating to the minority management in a, in a state uh, envisioned along the lines that, uh, that you have mentioned. Um, what I'm trying to figure out really is this, that is there firstly a critical mass attached or associated with this concept that the majority shall to, be declare, to declare a state, Islamic state, be 51% or 99% or something like that? Is there some such critical mass associated with it? I don't think there is any. Because I want to then proceed from there. Because if we take the position of 51.49, or <laughs> uh, we take position of 50.1 <laughs> and 49.9, I think we are in for a big trouble. And likewise, we are in a big trouble in fact, at any point, at any stage of, of, of this curve, any stage, and I, I shall try and explain it to you how, that we take a situation of, of any hypothetical country where you have a certain percentage of people who are so-called minorities. They have a right to live. They have a right to work. They have a right to produce children. They have a right to feed them. And they have a right to tell them, hey, this is your God. They don't have a right to tell the others, this is my God. But the others have a right to tell them, this is my God, and this is the God that is the true God. And therefore, you better believe in it, because that is my purpose and my mission. And now we are, I think, trying to create a different kind of situation here, firstly, that in terms of the cultural and religious identity of people, the so-called freedom really is in name. Because the freedom essentially implies co-equality of some kind. Otherwise, it is no freedom, because if there are constraints on freedom, because it's a relationship of a transaction. And if it is not a transactional situation, I think really the persons are constrained. That, that's one part of the thing. And then... I uh, think we take it one by one. Okay, yes, sir. Actually, you are thinking the modern sense of a secular state. What is a secular state? All religions, as religions, are equal, in theory at least, although every state can have some state religion, but no, all are equal. But regarding the collective system, the political socio-economic system, there is going to be no say of any religion. This is 100 percent against Islam. As I described yesterday, Islam is a deen, not a mazhab. It's a system. There can be no two systems coexisting. Islam doesn't believe in that. One has to be superior, the other inferior. The inferior one will, will become mazhab. That will be a religion. A set of beliefs and set of worship and this and this, that's all. But the system would be the dominant system will be, for example, for America, they want its own system of economy, their own system of liberal democracy, and that's secular democracy, etc., etc. 
Secondly, this concept of minority and this percentage, 51% or 49%, you know, actually Islam as a system can only be established through a revolutionary process. And a revolution is always brought about by a minority. What the communist majority in Russia to bring about the Bolshevik revolution? They have an ideology, they present the ideology, it is accepted, and then those people who accept, they are, they are integrated, organized, and then they topple the system. So this is actually Islam, if, if it comes, if it comes, and I think it is going to come, it is going to be the just world order of Islam. I, I, I think uh, th this concept really about uh, the revolution, uh, coming from a minority and uh, creating an Islamic state uh, possibly will hold good where the very significant majority of the population is, is, uh, is Muslim. No, Brother Nirmal, uh, we have before us the model of Muhammad. He was a single person. He propagated an ideology. He got one by one, one by one. Even after 10 years hardest labor, he didn't have more than 125 people with him. But then a whole revolution was brought about. So revolution means revolution. It has its own mechanics. Dr. Roger, please. Dr. Ahmed, you are the, uh, I'm beginning to understand your line of thought at this point. You are outlining to us an idealized system which you have thought through deeply, and there's one process missing. That process is by which the caliphate becomes how it is created, the process of the creation. It comes about through the jihad. And yet we already know that the, jih the jihad in Pakistan has been commercialized by U.S. money. But that's by the by. My main point is that revolution comes about through the overthrow of the state. And we know a great deal about revolution. Because whatever revolution has happened in the past has always been determined by the process that the revolution comes about. And you haven't mentioned to us, you haven't discussed that actual process itself. Now, let us look at only very, very briefly one revolution. And that was the Russian Revolution. And the very process that that revolution took place undermined it. It was destroyed by the process itself. It was not destroyed, as you said, <coughs> by the system of lack of incentives. That was a <coughs> byway. The key thing was that it tried to create a socialism in one country. And Trotsky wrote about that. And the point that I'm making is this. The Western ruling <coughs> classes took up jihad in using the modern terms, not their own term, but the Western ruling classes took up jihad against communism and fought it to the death. Because it wasn't, because it was only in one country. A big country, a rich country, but in only one country. And the very process that your Islamic State is created has been missed out altogether. And the ideally idealized version that you give us is only an idealized, idealized version, and we know from the past that the idealism from which it starts will be undermined by the process itself. Well, I have to make two comments. Number one, the process through which a revolution comes is going to be the topic of my talk tomorrow. So you are ahead the of the schedule. Day. <laughs> number two, when I was discussing ayah number 59 of the fifth surah, I should have said, 
because the constraint of time was too much that quran has not discussed how these people of authority will come up oh you who profess to believe you have to obey god his messenger and the people of authority from amongst your sense how they will come up by mutual consultation but the process of mutual consultation can be different as i said in a tribal society the chiefs of the tribes the heads of different houses and dynasties they sit together and they decide so abu bakr was chosen in the same way abu bakr appointed umar but by consulting the people and having their consent so these things you know they are there but today we can have a new system and this i said this adult franchise and all the muslims will be voting for the caliph so i think i had talked about that but you very rightly pointed to a vacuum in my talk i would like to follow on the heels of uh, roger's comments Uh, it seems to me that the methodological thrust of your talk in general is based on a cer- certain normative understanding of Islam. First of all, on the understanding of the Quran, the Sunnah, but above all, on a limited part of Islamic history, especially in the first 20 years of early Islam during the rightly guided caliphate, Al Khilafah Rashida. And in that sense, it seems to me that 1,400 years of Islamic history is absent from your own methodology, because you did not talk about that, although this is very significant. And this is somewhat problematic, and I want to give an example in terms of that methodological thrust. Let's say nowadays the ulama in Saudi Arabia uh, are somewhat split over political authority of the Saudi regime. Although the majority of the ulama in Saudi Arabia support the regime, there is a substantial minority that does not support the regime. And both ulama, those who support and those who oppose, are based or base their own judgment on the same normative understanding of Islam, on the Quran, on the traditions, as well as on that limited period of Islamic history. They rarely talk about 1,400 years of Islamic history. They come to different conclusions, that the majority want to preserve the status quo, whereas the minority wants to topple the status quo. So that's somewhat problematic that I see in terms of the methodological thrust. Another thing is in terms of Islamic institutions. I mean, you mentioned in passing there is no pope in Islam, which which can be true, I mean, in a sense. But that does not mean that Islamic history has not been full of Islamic institutions that have been as powerful as the Vatican in the Catholic world. So to say that Islamic history hasn't had institutions <coughs> is not and has not been accurate historically speaking. And therefore, it seems to me that in order to have more force to, to the argument that you have presented, we have to include uh, what I would call historical Islam in the discussion. And this what has been missing in your presentation. I agree with you 100% that has been missing, and it is intentional on my part. I say we have to take guidance from Quran, Sunnah, life of Muhammad and the past caliphate, that's all. It was Islam, total Islam, full Islam. Afterwards, it was not total Islam. The 1400 years you are talking about is the history of Muslims, not of Islam. The Prophet said, you know it better than myself. Islam started that it was a strange thing for people. And very soon it will become strange again. It was the growth of the Muslim as a nation and the Arabs as a nation. And it was Arab imperialism. It was monarchy. It was a dynasty which was ruling. And the institutions that developed that were under that monarchy. And that all of them were under the influence. So we have to go back to Quran and the Sunnah and the life of the Prophet 
and only the rightly guided four caliphs. That's all. Guidance is from there. Rest is history. Dr. Mumtaz, please. And if you like, I can quote another hadith. Yeah. The Prophet said that Takunu nabuwa tufikum, masha Allah wa takun. Summa Allah will ayarfa'u ha iza sha ayarfa'u. Summa takunu khilafatana bihaji nabuwa. It will be there so long as Allah wants it to be there. Then there will be a period of kingship, cruel kingship. The kingships of the Umayyads, the kingships of the Abbasids, that was not Islam. We have to be very clear in this regard. And we have to revive Islam. Not the Umayyad Islam or the, or the Abbasid Islam. And that is why I emphasize that we have to adopt the prophetic model of bringing a revolution, which, about which I'll be talking tomorrow, inshallah. Dr. Mumtaz Ahmed, Jainab. it is his cup of tea, uh, yeah. professor of political <laughs> science. Without milk. <laughs> okay. Uh, it appears to me that the Islamic society that you envision, in my view, will not be a society in which Muslims and non-Muslims will live in peace and harmony. First of all, you said that they will be they will not be given equal citizenship with the Muslims. So there will always be a feeling of being second-class citizens. And I can assure you, sir, no one wants to live as a second-class citizen. Are we creating an apartheid, in other words, in an Islamic society? If we deprive them as you have suggested, of holding positions of higher responsibility and ban those positions for them forever, what are the type of occupations that they are going to pursue? We cannot employ them in education because education is a very sacred thing in Islamic State where children will be indoctrinated in Islamic ideology. We cannot employ them in foreign office because Pakistan's foreign policy or Islamic State's foreign policy will be based on pursuing Islamic objectives. You cannot have them in legislature. You cannot have them in judiciary because judiciary will be making Islamic legal decisions. So what are the areas left in which they will operate? My, my feeling is that we will have an alienated minority, and if we take into consideration the fact that there are large number of Muslim societies where the number of non-Muslims is considerable, I'm thinking of Malaysia, Indonesia, Egypt, Bangladesh. Bangladesh. <clears throat> These societies will always be a conflict-ridden, tension-ridden societies, one. Secondly, you said that Quran prohibits Muslims to obey non-Muslim authorities. And that brings me back to my situation in the United States and five, six million Muslims who are living in the United States and millions who are living in Europe and 140 million who are living in India. Are we to defy the political authority of the societies in which we are living because they are non-Muslims? These are my comments. Concrete question I have is, you talked about shura, consultation. I have two questions about that. One, what is the concrete shape of shura that you suggest? Secondly, will the decisions made by this shura be based on consensus or on majority decision? Thirdly, will the decisions of Shura be binding on the ruler, or they will just be recommendatory, as was the Aul Haq's Shura? Now, where to start? Number one, I did admit in the first instance that the non-Muslims in Islamic State are not equal citizens, not full citizens, whether you like it or not. 
this is my opinion, in Islamic state, it's an ideological state, it's not a nation state. The professions, they can be doctors, they can be engineers, they can be businessmen, they can be teachers, teaching scientific you know, disciplines, they can be in service. But only top position where basic policy of the state is formed, those, only those will be accepted. Otherwise, business will be open to them, professions will be open to them. Go ahead. So this is the second point. And I have to be reminded by you what was the third point. Even I <laughs> no, apartheid, you know. Yeah, uh, related to that, my question was that this type of society, ipso facto, will be a conflict-ridden society, not peace with itself. In every society, there is conflict. Conflict between the haves and the have-nots. Apartheid was based on color, race, and the discrimination, you may call it, in an Islamic state, is based on ideology. Any black person, any person belonging to any other race, any other region of the world can adopt the ideology and he can become the full citizen. But sir, will it matter to me whether I have been discriminated against on the basis of my color or on the basis of my ideology? The fact remains that I have been discriminated. In Islamic State, in, in all ideological states, there has to be a discrimination on the basis of ideology. Otherwise, well, it is not an ideological state. Well, then not, does, does that not promote conflict? Hmm? Does that, by definition, then, as was asked here, not promote conflict? Be it discrimination because of color, we know that's promoted conflict. Because of race, we know that's promoted conflict. Or be it religion, we also know that's promoted conflict. So, will that not be the case here? Is there any society absolutely free from conflict? No, but the question Can still is, there will that promote person? it? I told you yesterday about jihad. Every living being is making jihad. The struggle for existence, the conflict is there. Uh, we're talking about Can I? Like, conflicts between communities. And I think that we have one major recent example in Islamic history, the example of the Sudan. Because the Islamic government of the Sudan, after Bashir came to power in 89, under the influence of Hassan Torabi, wanted to implement Islamic law in the same way that you have been portraying here. And we know that the results have not been successful so far. Because that kind of implementation, uh, in addition to other problems in the Sudan that go back to its own independence in 1954, there had been a major conflict between the Christian animistic South and the North Arab Islamic uh, part of the Sudan. And we know that one of the major results of this conflict has been, uh, in a sense, the weakening of the Islamic front headed by Hassan Torabi and the signing of the agreement only last week between John Karanj and the, uh, and the government of the Sudan. So in a sense, that conflict has seeped away, has destroyed the energies of the Sudan as a state and the alternative has not been Islamic. What we see now is more coexistence between the Christians in the South and the Muslims in the North. My comment is that Islam in Sudan was coming through majority, not through any revolution. Were the Muslims <clears throat> actually practicing Islam totally? No, there was a military Did coup. they make any dawah? Yes, it was a military coup, that's all. I told you Islamic State, true Islamic State can be established only through a revolution. Uh, I have a not question. only, so, not because... Yeah, uh, he has yet to answer my question on the Shura. That's right. Yeah, I think he still has three questions on the answer. Yes, Shura in a modern Islamic State will be binding. Although parliamentary system is also mubah, permissible and presidential also. But the presidential system today is nearer to the Islamic system. There is the chief executive and there is the Congress. And the chief executive is having his secretaries and ministers from wherever he likes, not from the Congress or the Senate. 
बिकॉज दीज टू थिंग्स हैव टू बी एब्सोल्यूटली सेपरेट एंड डिस्टिंग फ्रॉम ईच अदर सो दिस विल बी द केस लेजिस्लेचर विल बी द शूरा एंड इट विल बी बाई मेजोरिटी ओनली एक्सेप्शन इज दैट एवरी सिटीजन विल हैव ए राइट टू नॉक द डोर ऑफ द सुपीरियर कोर्ट्स that this has transgressed the limits of the sharia because the item in the in the constitution would be no legislation can be done here at any level repugnant to the quran and the sunnah and the chief executive would be the president and that is nearer you know to islamic system yes sir. i think third uh, uh, yeah, my question is uh, related with the previous uh, subject Now, just let us think that what you have said is totally correct and fits to Islam, Quran and Sunnah. But with thinking the very pragmatic side of it, that now, if you have a Islamic state in Pakistan, no, no, I mean, if you you will have okay. with, with Islamic revolution and you will successful. If how many people are living here now? I think about hundred and forty, hundred and forty million. Yes, and then. around i would say around 1 billion people are in danger then muslims because <laughs> i mean if you exclude the rest and then the muslims in, living in other <coughs> states will be excluded as well if you exclude non muslims here i mean you treat them in second say not first class citizen but second class citizen i think this is coming from british rule of caste system first class citizen second class citizen. then all the muslims will be treated in the other part of the world as second class citizens and just very pragmatic uh, way of uh, thinking i think this is uh, dangerous for the, the rest of the muslims uh, what you, what is your comment on this brother if you think pragmatically we should bow before george bush and here is the safety But if we study the professed life, that there please, is a pragmatist please, way of approach. Please, please let also. me say. But if you believe in something that is true, and your belief is there, you have to go by that. And if the Muslims in the non-Muslim majority countries are treated at par with the non-Muslims in Islamic State, I would be happy. They should have their mazhab. their mazhab will be protected and they will be minorities i tell you my study is that the muslims in india have no benefit from this system from secularism none and if they say we are a minority give us our rights of as a minority they will be far better my questions i've i've got two questions one theological and one directly related to this so if i take the uh, latter first if i take the question about um like norton christianity has a history of wanting to create christian states i mean christendom i suppose was the obvious example of this but richard hooker in england argued that only an englishman who was a member of the church of england can be a full citizen and you get versions of this all the time ts eliot the 20th century poet took a similar line in his idea of a christian society and in america they endlessly flirt with the idea of christian america and the question is is simple really if a movement amongst christians in a christian nation develops to create a christian state would you be happy to live there as a second class citizen defined in the way that you defined it and also forbidden to proselytize and explain your faith to others in that society i have said already yes you would be happy to live they in that they have their right to establish the state according to their religion now there will be competition what type of state you bring forth what type of state islam brings forth and what is more acceptable to the humanity at large there will be a competition come on have a christian state have a hindu state and tell us what hindu state is so this is my answer to this question okay. now no, next that's, that's very helpful okay my second question flows from that then and it's a theological question 
And I just want to focus for a moment on, on proselytizing, on missionary work. It's because I believe in God and that God ultimately will not allow that which is, what will be ultimately God will permit, that I don't spend all my time worrying about diversity in society because the truth will come through. And it's because I'm confident in that truth, I would more than happily invite you to America to visit churches and to explain your understanding of Islam and let people decide what they think is true. Because the God we worship, I'm sufficiently confident in, will allow the varieties of forms of faith to emerge and whatever is ultimately true can withstand diversity and questions and disagreement. And it's almost as if you don't have sufficient confidence, if you don't mind me saying so, in the God you worship, and you fear that if there are other people in society, they will endlessly undermine your faith. It sounds as if you're not that confident that your faith can withstand diverse perspectives. As far as this question of somebody, some Christian coming to our mosque and be allowed to present his case, I think it is not against Islam. What the missions do, they go and address the depressed classes of the society. And there they help them and they change their faith on this basis, not on their argument. This is mission. This we will not allow. Number two, because Islam is a state, we can't allow anything which can erode the state. We have to keep the state strong. Okay. Thank you. When we speak about Islamic Ummah, Islamic Ummah is not the same as Islamic State. But you seem to be saying that we need to reconstitute the Islamic Ummah in the modern era by means of an Islamic political system. Now, this is not a new argument, but this is a 20th century argument. This is not a 19th century argument in modern Islamic thought. Take the example of Muhammad Abdo of Egypt or Sir Ahmad Khan of India that you are familiar with. They never argued on behalf of establishing an Islamic state as a means of reconstituting the Islamic Ummah. They said that we can reconstitute Islamic Ummah without an Islamic state. This was very clear in their own writings. Whereas the argument of establishing a political system to safeguard the Islamic Ummah is a 20th century argument appearing primarily with force in the writings and activities of Sheikh Hassan Banna in Egypt, in the writings and activities of, as Maududi. you know, Maududi in India and later on Pakistan. But this is a novel phenomenon that has to be understood in the context of Islamic responses to colonialism in both situations. Egypt was dominated by the British when the Ikhwan appeared in 1928. Uh, India was controlled by the British as well when the Jamaat appeared in Lahore in 1941. So one has to understand that in, in that sense. But what I'm trying to say that this is true, this is one major Islamic argument that in order to constitute the Islamic Ummah in the present time, we need to have an Islamic political system. That's to say an Islamic state, such as in Iran. But this is only one Islamic argument because in the 19th century, this argument was not forceful at all within Islamic circles. Actually, what was happening in the 19th century and um, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was a struggle for freedom. And we were nations. You are using the word Ummah. Where the Ummah exists? There's no Ummah at all. Allama Iqbal was the spokesman for this Ummah, the biggest. But he had to concede in his lectures. No Muslim Ummah exists today. So we have Muslims but not Ummah. Yes. We have Muslim nations. He said, instead we have Muslim nations. And now we have Muslim countries. That's all. There's no Ummah. Ummah must have an Imam. The same route. 
امام اینڈ امہ وی ہیو ٹو ری کانسٹیٹیوٹ اٹ تھرو اے ٹرولی اسلامک اسٹیٹ part of your presentation. We haven't talked about economy. I will seek your guidance on some of the points. As you know, there has been a debate about the Islamization of economy in Pakistan. Some kind of interest-free banking was instituted under Ziaul Haq's government in this country. First, I would like your views about the type of interest-free system that was instituted here. But more fundamentally, I would like you to reflect upon the impact on the government financing of Islamic economic system that you are suggesting. Would an Islamic tax code be capable of funding a modern government? And how does Pakistan's current tax regime based on sales tax, income tax, import, export fit into the Islamic code? And finally, how Pakistan will borrow in international markets. If I can remember, you know, whatever you have said, number one, I don't say that the banking system that was proposed by Zia and later on by the Sharia court is 100% Islamic. There is element of riba and interest in that. Based on Bayam Muajjal and Bayam Murabaha, you know, if you buy this cup cash, it is 10 rupees. If you pay me after one month, it is 11 rupees. What is this? Actually, during the monarchy region of Islam, the history of Islam, two types of interest and riba entered our fiqh under the influence of the rulers. Number one, this bayam murabha and bayam wajala, it is interest. Number two, the absentee landlordism, it is interest. It's haram. It's haram, forbidden according to Imam Abu Hanifa. It is haram and forbidden according to Imam Malik. It is haram and forbidden according to Shafi. But only the person who accepted that office, government office, disciple of Imam Abu Hanifa, Qazi Abu Yusuf, he declared it to be lawful, along with Imam Muhammad. So these are the things, these are the realities over here. And true Islamic economic system can be established only after a truly Islamic revolution. Can, can, can I uh, the taxes? Hmm? Yes, taxes bar, are allowed. Import tax, bar. import tax, export tax, they were there in the bias caliphate. Zoraib, they were called. So you do not agree with the argument given by some of the ulama that after you collect zakat, you no, cannot, no, no, state cannot no, impose no, any not tax. At all. No. What about international trade? How Pakistan is going to interact with international uh, monetary agencies, international finance, international trade? If we have this self-respect, we shall be on our own feet, on our own legs, and we shall deal with the people. If we are strong enough, they will need to deal with us, and they will deal with us on our own terms. But if we are weak, can I, can I just uh, expand on this? Because the, con the economic aspect of your talk this morning was the shortest bit. And to my way of thinking, the economy is the root of everything. Because if you cannot live, you cannot eat and so forth. If you cannot and eat, you cannot live. You cannot live. You cannot, if you haven't, yeah, yeah, obviously. No, this is not the point of what I want to say. Um, the essence of your argument is what I would call Islam in one country. And the problem of the lack of analysis of imperialism and its economic forces, however strong you are, you are overlooking and you are ignoring. Because the essence of imperialism today is to the world bodies of the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO. And through these mechanisms, the Western world, and in particular the United States, have controlled most of the third world. And none of this comes out. And however you organize internally, you cannot ignore the 
institutions and the forces of imperialism. And as far as I can see, you are. Can you comment on that? What was the beginning? How My did you begin? Is Islam in one country? In one, no. Islam has to become global, and that is the destiny, as I believe. But it will have to start from one country. Just as it started from the Arabian Peninsula, and then that was through conquest. This is Lenin. This is. This is Lenin. But I am saying what I mean. I have never read Lenin. I have never read. You should. <laughs> but I, for me, Quran is enough, and the life of the Prophet is enough. I need not read Lenin or Ho Chi Minh or somebody else. So it, it has to spread then. And I said yesterday, at that time, at the time of the Prophet, the spread was through conquest. Now because you have the television, you have the IT, you have all these measures, you can propagate the ideology throughout the world. And if you produce a sample, a model of true Islamic state, humanity is in search of a just social order. It is running from east to west and west to east, from monarchy to capitalism, from capitalism to communism, from communism back to, what is it? The whole, the soul of humanity, soul, is in search of a just social order. But we have some disagreement here, do we not, on what constitutes a just social order. We, you might have we don't, You and I don't agree, agree as yes, we have brother. disagreement around the table. Yes, brother. You might have a concept of your own, and I would very much like to know that. But here I have to say and present before you the concept of Islam. We understand that. But we also acknowledge, do we not, that just social order, that we have a variety of interpretations of what just or just social order is and or should be. And only a model will prove what happened in USSR. One party, no right of vote for the citizens whatsoever. That's only one it, party government. That's not how it started. Hmm? That's how it ended. It ended as a single party state because of the process of the revolution. The original idea was not as it turned out. Whatever might have happened, but that was the fact. And I told you, we shall have, you know, multiple party system. I have a question. Uh, uh, now, to me, uh, since we have means of uh, provocating, in propagating. Yeah, propagating Islam, introducing ideas, etc., with the means of TVs, internet, and a lot of things that like you've said. Instead of uh, establishing an Islamic state with a revolution and uh, having a, a model of state or, or a, a state model, let us have a state as a model Muslim. Model, model Muslim, model. one person, and then propagate uh, that model person to uh, six billion people instead of putting very strong borders and then having confrontation and uh, a lot of dangers. Uh, now, this is, I think, is, is possible and much easier by having a model Muslim person and then uh, exemplifying uh, what is the prophetic model? Did uh, he go on preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching? <laughs> Did he send preachers to other countries? Yes. No. First after place. after he has Yemen. success. Well, let us think. First. After he has he had success no, no, in no, no, Arabian no. Now, let us think about Yemen people. Some people came to Prophet and they said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then he said, he asked Prophet, what is my duty? He said, you should go to Yemen and then preach to others. This is, I mean, but if we, if we go to... was after people, the establishment of the Islamic State in Before the Yes. Yeah, no, after. Yes, yeah. after it. And, and, and you and know, he didn't send emissaries anywhere before the Hudabiyah, which Quran calls in Fatahna Laka Fatah Mubina. Only after that he sent people and he sent letters of inviting the monarchs and kings. 
So actually and we have a prophetic model before us and that is to establish an Islamic state, make it a model for humanity, come and see for, with your own eyes this is Islam and that will be the biggest preacher. Let's go back to the yeah, Roger's to question. Yeah, just, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Some part of your speech, I mean your talk, you said that is Islamic State is only for the 20, 20 years of what we call it uh, full Islamic Asasadet. State, yes. yes. And then, but later on, you said that Islam is spread all over the world. Now, it is, when we see this, and when Prophet took Islam as a uh, personal uh, model to, to others, it spread quite fast and quite effectively. Not at all. When the personal became, model at Makkah. How many people accepted Islam at Makkah? For 13 years, he yeah. was himself preaching. Yeah, but those people... But what was the case? But those people were the good example. Brother, no. we must look to history as it is. Yeah, but when they, they were good examples, it spread quite fast, okay? O although it was very difficult in the first case. But afterwards, you also accept that it deteriorated from its original, uh, say, line. It and came one step down. Just, you know, if you have six stories building and the final six story is gone, five were intact. Islamic law was enforced by the kings also. The Sharia was enforced. But the political system was not Islamic now. Dr. Mumtaz Ahmed will make the last comment as an insider. Oh, no. as an insider. In the lighter vein, uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to uh, ask you something. Uh, it's a, when you began your presentation yesterday, you said there are three forms of creations. Then you talked about three types of jihad and three stages of resistance. And every level had its own three sub-levels. When I was reading last night your pamphlet on religious obligations of Muslim women, you talk about three levels of our religious duties and then three differences between women's obligations and men's obligations. And uh, the second level, you talk again the three circles of dawah. And when I read your active agenda for the Muslim ummah, what do I find? It has three action point program. My question is, is there some mystical fascination with Trinity? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A good joke. <laughs> A refreshing laughter. Are we done? Because, you know, Narva wanted to ask a question and I have a comment to make yeah. too. Can we take a okay. Well, if you have the patience. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I actually was uh, uh, very touched by your reference uh, to your concern for humanity at large in the last couple of minutes. And I, I, I thought that possibly should be the crux of the whole thing. And I was trying to uh, understand in my own mind that in your model, which you have presented, you are telling the minorities, hey, you give up some things, but I give you protection. That's, that's what I, I read. That uh, you give up certain things, you will lose certain benefits of so-called citizenship, but there is a trade-off in that I give you protection. protection is a huge zimma, is a huge, huge responsibility. It's a huge word. People seek protection. They want protection. They want security. They want assurance about some kind of stability, about their way of life, about various things. OK, without, uh, without dilating on it. And what I was thinking in a constructive uh, uh, way of suggestion was this, that possibly if there could be some kind of a comparative evaluation of your model via we, the democratic structure, the compassionate conservative capitalism or something which is propagated 
uh, that as to the likely advantages and disadvantages that accrue to minorities, because eventually we are looking for harmony uh, of, of some kind. And minorities are not essentially based on religion. They can be based on various things. And minorities emerge, new minorities. If Pakistan was 100% Muslim, even then new minorities will emerge. They will be sectarian. There will be, I mean, there are more Shias killed in Pakistan than Sikhs or Hindus in the last 50 years. Uh, so I see that Sikhs and Hindus possibly, whatever their small population is, they have been very safe. Somehow this zima has been taken and they have been protected. Whereas the Muslim zima has not been taken in India and they have been, they've been killed in, in large numbers. But they have other opportunities. Is there some kind of a potential trade-off? Is there in the aggregate a possibility that we can create a more human, humane society? Because your concern, express concern of your faith and every faith is eventually that we are all God's children, whatever our calling, and God intended for us that this life and this world should be for us to live, to love God, to love God's creation, to do service, and to realize, to realize the higher truth, and to realize it living here in this world with one another. So, so that's where my All suggestion. those things that you have said are very precious and they must be sought out. But what about the law? That is not my problem. I'm looking <laughs> for a human society what about the law? and law what about will the follow. System? Law there should follow. There can be one law. There can be one system. So you have to establish the law and the system of your own it is. and give the maximum facilities to those who don't agree with you. That's all. Thank you. We will reassemble here at uh, quarter past six. Sure. Six fifteen.